As your confessor, I beg you to consider the urgent necessity of this disputation. Why? Because I believe the previous disputations have been mismanaged, Your Majesty. In what way? The chief mistake has been that we have attempted to dispute with the Jews without sufficient knowledge of the Jewish mind. I may remind Your Majesty that we have not been entirely unsuccessful. We have converted some learned Jews who are now ornaments of our academy, and I refer particularly to our cherished brother, Pablo Cristiani. It is he, a converted Jew himself, who will represent Christianity at this disputation. Not yourself. Don't overestimate me, Your Majesty. If I led this disputation, it would have no chance of success. They must be led to Christ by one of themselves. Pablo Cristiani will gather the remnant of Israel into the arms of Mother Church. And the prophecy of the blessed Paul will be fulfilled. And the last days will come. And Christ Messiah will descend upon the earth to bless his great servant, King James of Aragon, by whose wisdom and virtue this disputation came about. And all my sins will be forgiven. You have done well, James. Now you will be remembered as a great king. A great Catholic king. And not as a Jew-loving whoremonger. Hmm? You will best show your love for the Jews by trying to save their souls. And at last you are giving some thought to your own salvation. Believe me, Yolanda, I know the Jews a great deal better than you do. It will take a miracle. Unfortunately, my affairs are not being handled as well now as they were when the Jews were looking after them. Our noblemen are godly Christians, but as organizers... Yet the spiritual affairs of your kingdom are in good order, James. A little disorder in material matters can soon be corrected. And what if the disputation fails to convert the Jew? Pablo Cristiani knows the Talmud so well, he will convert the rabbi and the rest will follow. Rabbi? Oh, they have one whom they revere, especially. I didn't think the Jews revered anybody very much. That is true. The Jews have, in general, very little sense of reverence. Reverence is a Christian virtue. Yet, sometimes there appears among them someone whom they admire, and then their devotion is great. Such a man exists now. Who is this man? Rabbi Moses ben Nachman. We are convinced that Rabbi Moses is the key. If he is converted, all the rest of the Jews will follow. And what if you fail to convert this remarkable rabbi? Then we must think of other means. Your love for the Jews is great indeed. Brother Pablo, I am sorry to have kept you waiting. You're a busy man, Brother Raymond. Your concerns are for the whole of Christendom and far beyond. If my plans become too grandiose, I shall be grateful for any criticism you may have to offer, Brother Pablo. Perhaps we're placing too much reliance on the power of reason, Brother Raymond. The Mohammedans and the Jews may not, after all, be moved by reason. You're not feeling doubtful about the disputation, are you? Not at all. It's just that I think perhaps my view of its purpose may be different to yours. What do you mean? I see it more as a way of exerting pressure. But reason exerts the greatest pressure. Good reasons count for nothing unless they are backed by power. Was it the power of the church then, rather than its argument, that turned you from a Jew to a Christian? Power is an argument. It was the power of the church in France that forced my family to flee to Spain. Massacre is an argument the Jews in Aragon have yet to face. Yes, the French have different methods. The French king says that the only way to dispute with a Jew is to drive a dagger into him. He is perhaps too zealous. But at least the Jews in France know where they stand. He makes them all wear a yellow badge. Yes, I believe you had a hand in that. 
There will be no undue pressure in this hour disputation. No threats, no bullying. You understand? Yes. For the present, we must proceed with caution. But it'll be no kindness to the Jews in the long run to go on feeding their illusions. God has turned his favor away from them. They are swimming against the tide of history. They must be made to realize that Christ's church has the power and the glory forever. You make a fine archbishop one day, Brother Pablo. But for the present, shall we begin our preparation? I've heard much about you, Pablo Cristiani. Sire, if I can be the humble instrument for the enlightenment of my erring nation, I shall not have lived in vain. Tell me, were you always a rabbi? Not quite a rabbi, Your Majesty. Before I completed my training in the Talmud, I had realized that many sayings, many Jewish writings, testify to God's plan to fulfill Judaism in Christianity. For a long time, I had been oppressed by the feeling that the Jews have been rejected by God. As I searched the texts further and further, every step confirmed that view. I hope fervently to lead my brothers along that same path. It will be a blessed work, Pablo Cristiani. Have you completed your preparations for the disputation? Not quite, Your Majesty. When you were a Jew, were you by any chance a physician? I have this damnable. No, sire. I'm, I never had any training in that art. Pity. Your Majesty's Rabbi Moses has arrived. Call him in. You will be able to meet your opponent, Brother Pablo. Your Majesty is most considerate. This promises to be a most interesting contest. I would beg you to adopt a more serious attitude towards this disputation. This is not a cockfight or a tournament between your knights. You are, of course, quite right, Yolanda. But one cannot help taking a certain sporting interest. Your Majesties, may I present Rabbi Moses of Girona. You are most welcome, Rabbi Moses. I have heard that you are a person well worthy of the honor of representing the Jewish community in our disputation. With respect, Your Majesty, it is an honor I would much prefer to decline. Decline? We are disappointed in you, Rabbi. Does the opposition frighten you? Not at all, Your Majesty. I'm not afraid of opposition. Nor am I averse to disputations. I've been engaged in disputations all my life. What is your objection, then? When the lion invites the mouse to a disputation, Your Majesty, the mouse, however fond he may be of arguing, would do well to avoid the disputation if he can, for the poor mouse does not know which to fear most, losing the argument or winning it. What are you afraid of, Rabbi? There have been other disputations, Your Majesty, and they have always ended in suffering for the Jewish people. In Paris recently... We are not barbarous French. We know the rules of fair play. I guarantee your safety and that of your fellow Jews during and after the disputation. I thank your majesty and accept your assurance. I wish now to raise another point. In the other disputations, many rules were laid down about what the Jewish disputants were allowed to say. I don't understand. It was necessary, of course, to lay down some rules. Otherwise, the Jewish disputants might have uttered some shocking blasphemies. May I ask the learned brother Raymond, Your Majesty, whether he intends to lay down such rules for the present disputation? Only a few, Your Majesty. It is necessary to ensure that no blasphemies be uttered against the person of our blessed Lord and Saviour, nor against his blessed mother, the Virgin Mary. I'm afraid if I'm to represent the case for Judaism adequately, I cannot undertake to avoid remarks which to the Christian might appear blasphemous. Raymond, the rabbi is right. You may use whichever arguments you choose. You have complete liberty of speech. I thank your majesty. I hope you will not use this liberty to revile and blaspheme Christianity. I am aware of the rules of common courtesy. I hope you will enter the disputation, Rabbi Moses, with a mind open to the truth. I enter the contest with a mind as open as your own, Brother Raymond. By which he means, Raymond, that you and Brother Pablo must entertain the possibility of being converted to Judaism. By the way, Rabbi, may I introduce you to your antagonist, Brother Pablo Cristiani, 
who was once of your faith. I am honored to have such an antagonist as you, Rabbi Moses. I look forward with interest to your arguments. May God bless our disputation and bring it to a good conclusion. Amen. Your Majesties, Reverend Bishops, Lords, by order of His Christian Majesty King James, we begin today a disputation between Christianity and Judaism. His Majesty's object in holding this disputation is to draw his Jewish subjects to Christ by reason and persuasion. Speaking for Christianity is Brother Pablo Cristiani, and for Judaism, Rabbi Moses ben Nachman. Rabbi Moses. Your Majesties, I too believe that reason is alone sufficient to settle these matters. As my first contribution, I should like to suggest certain lines on which the discussion should proceed. I suggest we should devote ourselves to two questions which in my view are the most vital. What are they, Rabbi Moses? The first question is, is the Messiah come or is he yet to come? The second question, is the Messiah prophesied in scriptures a man or a divine being? Do you agree with this proposal, Brother Pablo? I do, Your Majesty. I'm astonished that we have reached agreement on procedure so rapidly. There is one point I wish to raise, Your Majesty. Yes? Rabbi Moses has referred to prophecy in scripture, but not to the Talmud. If I may explain, the Talmud is the book of Jewish traditions which date to a time long before the birth of Christ. It explains the laws and stories and prophecies of the Old Testament in such a thoroughgoing way that the Jewish faith without it would be shorn of a great deal of its content. It is my contention that the Talmud also proves that the divine Messiah has come. Rabbi Moses, do you agree that the Talmud should be brought into this discussion? I have no objection, Your Majesty. However, I should like to give Brother Pablo a friendly warning, which may save him a great deal of time and trouble. It is simply that we Jews do not always agree with everything we find in the Talmud. But do you not accept that the Talmud is a holy book? To the Jews. I do, but the Talmud is a record of discussions. These discussions took place between rabbis over the course of about 500 years on every aspect of Jewish religion. Obviously, when two rabbis disagree, which happens on every page of the Talmud, both cannot be accepted as right. Consequently, many sayings in the Talmud are not accepted by the Jews. I see. Moreover, Your Majesty, there is another point to be considered. Yes. Yeah. It is only the legal parts of the Talmud, the Halakha, that Jews consider binding. The non-legal parts, the Haggadah, being poetical and open to various interpretations, are not considered binding. The subject of the Messiah belongs to the poetical part of the Talmud. This is a very strange holy book. The Talmud is a holy book, but not what Christians mean by a holy book. But what about the Bible? Do you not accept that the Bible is a holy book? More so, even, than the Talmud? Yes, but then, we are seldom sure what the Bible means. That is what the discussions in the Talmud are all about. It seems that you are going to be rather difficult to pin down in this discussion, Rabbi. Brother Pablo, can you elicit from the Rabbi a clearer statement? I shall do my best, Your Majesty. Now, Rabbi Moses, I think you have been exaggerating the flexibility of the Jewish religious attitude a little. I was a Jew myself for many years, and your description of Judaism doesn't quite tally with my recollection of it. Perhaps you have forgotten something since you became a Christian. I don't think so. Or perhaps there were certain things about Judaism that you never understood. Tell me, is there such a thing as heresy in Jewish religion? Yes, there is. And what is a heretic in Jewish law? A Jew who denies an essential principle of the Jewish faith. And what are the essential principles of the Jewish faith? That is a matter of dispute. Surely there are some articles of a faith beyond dispute. There are some, yes. The unity of God is one, the revelation on Mount Sinai another, but we have no agreed and definitive set of theological doctrines as you Christians have, for which you are prepared to burn people as heretics. 
Is it not true, Rabbi Moses, that you Jews give great respect to the recorded sayings of the rabbis, even though they may not necessarily be fully authoritative? That is so. If you found that many sayings of the rabbis point to the conclusion that the Messiah has already come and that he is divine, would this fact impress you? It certainly would. I propose to prove that many sayings in the Talmud show unmistakably both that the Messiah has already come and that his nature is divine. If you can prove that, you will have struck a great blow for your side of this disputation. The question is, has the Messiah come? Father Pablo, your majesty is. Let me begin by citing a passage not from the Old Testament, but from the Talmud. The Talmud says, at the time when the temple was destroyed, the Messiah was born. What an extraordinary statement. The temple was destroyed about 1,200 years ago, round about the time of the beginning of Christianity. Now, let me put the question directly to Rabbi Moses. Why are the Jews waiting for the Messiah when their own Talmud tells them that he came 1,200 years ago? What do you have to say to this, Rabbi Moses? Your Majesty, with respect to Brother Pablo, the Talmud does not say that the Messiah came at the time of the destruction of the temple. It only says he was born then. But isn't that much the same thing? No, Your Majesty. When Moses came to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, it was 80 years after he was born. That was hardly a task for a newborn babe. Similarly, the date of the Messiah's birth is by no means the same as the date of his coming. And when will be his coming? When he leads the Jews back to the Holy Land. That hasn't happened yet, so he hasn't yet come. Do you mean to tell us that the Messiah was born 1,200 years ago and that he still hasn't come? Yes. He must be getting pretty long in the tooth then, 1,200 years old. Adam lived almost as long as that. And Elijah, who never died, has lived very much longer and will return together with the Messiah. And where has the Messiah been all this time? The Talmud says in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> Do you really believe that? Many more incredible things than that are believed in the name of religion, Your Majesty. I personally do not believe that the Messiah was born at the time of the destruction of the temple. I think he has not yet been born. But the Talmud says quite distinctly that he was born then. It is poetry, a parable. You Christians know what parables are. It's a way of saying that hope is born in the very depths of despair. It should not be taken literally. Are you saying that the Talmud is telling lies? The parable is not a lie. But Rabbi Moses, you are shifting your ground. Not at all. If you want to take literally that the Messiah was born, then I have given you my answer. I personally do not take it literally. That's clear enough, surely? Pablo. Rabbi Moses has great power. The power of the cross is greater. Oh, yes. I'm quite used to coping with a Jew in myself. But he's always going to be there. Of course. After all, our Lord was a Jew. So were all the apostles. What a marvelous Christian Rabbi Moses would make. Do you ever have regrets? Yes, sometimes. When the festivals come round, I pass the synagogue and snatches of music reach me. These feelings are very natural. They must be suppressed. And feelings of remorse. The whole world is obsolete. God has pronounced judgment on it. The church needs you, just as you are. You know,
nomine Pacis et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. My final argument depends not on the interpretation of texts, but on the immutable truth of history itself. Even more surely than scripture or inspired traditions does history reveal God's will. Once the Jews had a mighty organization with a temple in Jerusalem, the wonder of the world. But God decreed that that temple should be raised to the ground and that in its place Christ's church should arise and be made great with its center in Rome and its great cathedrals in many lands, each one outshining the temple in the height of its glory. And what of the Jews? They have become slaves and exiles. Is not this the strongest proof of all that the Messiah has come? That they have lost the Christ's church is triumphant. The Messiah has come, and the Christian church is the living proof. Let the Jews cease to swim against the tide of history. Instead of dragging out a miserable and persecuted existence that can only become more and more wretched as time goes on, let them join in the triumph of the church. The Jew turned his face against the Messiah when he came, and now God turns his face against them. As a Jew, I suffered under that curse, but Jesus Christ released me. God's church is merciful, the door is still open. Before it is too late, let the Jews enter in and throwing themselves on his infinite mercy, share in God's manifold blessings. <laughs> Your Majesties, I must say at once that Brother Pablo's arguments have left me entirely unconvinced. That the Messiah has come, says Brother Pablo, is proved by the triumph of the Church. We are now living in the messianic era prophesied in the Bible. Glory was prophesied, and glory is here. In the shape of the Pope and priesthood, cathedrals and mighty rulers. Is this indeed the messianic era? When we read in the Bible of the prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah about the coming of the Messiah, what is the most obvious thing that strikes us? It is that the coming of the Messiah will make the world a different place. Instead of a world of strife and bloodshed, of ceaseless agony and famine and warfare, there will be a world of peace and goodwill, a time of Sabbath, when the swords will be beaten into plowshares and the wolf will lie down with the lamb and the peace of God will reach to the four corners of the earth. This is the time of the Messiah to which we Jews look forward, when the apparently meaningless agonies of the past will all prove to have had meaning after all, and true history will begin, and our struggles will prove to have been the birth pangs of a better world. But what has happened? Over 1,200 years since the birth of Jesus, I look around the world. Is it a world of peace? Have the swords been beaten into plowshares? Now the world is more full of war than ever, and the most warlike of all the peoples, whose fierceness is greater than that of wolves, is the people of Christendom, the followers of Jesus. Oh. Your majesty is a great king in Christendom. Your knights in armor clash like thunder. You have your foot soldiers and archers and engines of war. If you believe that the Messiah has come, why do you not dismiss all your soldiers and enter the peace of God? The world is full of war and armies. Not far away are the armies of the Muslims. Beyond them, the armies of the Mongols and the Tartars. And beyond them, who knows what other armies? Where does it say in the writings of our prophets which you say you believe? That the coming of the Messiah will bring not love but hate. Not peace, but war. Another point. The coming of the Messiah, according to all the Hebrew prophets, was to be a time of justice. I look around the world which you Christians have made of your faith in Jesus. Is it a world of brotherhood and equality? There is no Jewish aristocracy, no Jewish slavery. No Jew is Lord over Jews. 
No nation on this earth, except ourselves, has learned to live this way. Have you a higher standard of justice to teach us? What has happened to the new heart of which Ezekiel spoke when he said, I will give you a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. If this is the new world of which the prophet spoke, it would have been better if they had remained silent. Oh, Your Majesty, I must speak. We Christians are never nearer to Christ than when we suffer oppression, as Christ himself suffered. A slave can come to Christ as well as or better than an emperor. That is a very comfortable doctrine for oppressors to hear. I do not believe that anyone is better for being a slave. Freedom and equality must wait for the second coming. So it seems that all the real benefits of the coming of the Messiah are left for the second coming. The first coming has not been without its benefits. Ah, oh, yes, the triumph of the church. Brother Pablo made a great point of this and of the failure and suffering of us Jews. You Christians make a great mystery out of failure and talk of your suffering Messiah whose failure proves his divinity and then say that our suffering means that we are accursed. The failure and suffering of the Jews was predicted by the Hebrew prophets and they also predicted that a time would come when the nations would acknowledge that the Jews have suffered for the sins of the world. It is Christ who suffered for the sins of the world, not the Jews. And so it was foretold by the prophet Isaiah. I say that the suffering servant depicted by Isaiah was not Jesus, but the Jewish people. And the suffering servant is still in your midst. And you followers of Jesus are his chief persecutors. Your Majesty, are we to allow this blasphemy? He is saying that the Jews are Christ and that we Christians are his crucifiers. I promised him free speech. Your Majesty, I submit that we do not need to bandy texts. We have only to look around the world to see that the Messiah has not come. A Messiah who does not make the world better is no Messiah. And a Messiah who says it does not matter whether the world is better or not is worse than no Messiah. We Jews say that the world is still unredeemed and that the Messiah will not come until the world has deserved to receive him. Your Majesty. Only the devil himself would have such We must have cunning. patience. I have heard that this blasphemous rabbi is an adept at their black magic, which they call a Kabbalah. He is an expert Kabbalist, Your Majesty, but the Kabbalah is not black magic. It's a kind of mystical philosophy. It contains no invocations of the devil. Tell me the truth, Kablo Christiani. Did you never see black magic practiced when you were a Jew? Did you never see Christian children sacrificed and their blood used for unholy purposes? Never. Such things are unheard of in the Jewish faith. I tell you, they're not an uncivilized people, they're over-civilized. They think themselves too clever to need salvation. Well, we must out-argue them, as Christ himself did when he condescended to argue with the Pharisees. May I remind you that the first question has already been debated. So far, Rabbi Moses seems to be out-arguing us. Who knows what effect my arguments are having on him? I see little sign of him breaking down. Are we to allow his insults to Christ to go unpunished? The king has ruled that he must if be subject... If I had my way, I would have him broken on the wheel. I thought it was just obstinacy that made them refuse to acknowledge Christ. The truth is far worse. They look upon us as unenlightened heretics and idolaters. Your Majesty. At last you are beginning to understand the extent of the problem. I speak plainly. I think it unlikely that we shall convert the rabbi or bring about a mass conversion by this disputation. As I see it, what we need is a long campaign. This is only the beginning. The beginning. We shall flood the country with accounts of the disputation, demonstrating the defeat of the Jewish argument. I myself will visit all their congregations calling for conversions. That's when the real campaign will start. When they see how the land lies, how the climate is changing. You'd be surprised how many conversions we shall get then. Suppose the rabbi retaliates by issuing his own account of the disputation. Then we have him. The king gave him permission to speak, not to write. If he writes down blasphemies such as he has spoken... 
The king may take a different view. That will be a matter for papal intervention. Your Majesty, the king is no longer a young man. He fears for his immortal soul. Now he can't afford to cross the Pope. Good. There is some prospect of seeing Rabbi Moses at the stake yet. We shall see how his arguments stand up to Rome. The question is, is the Messiah prophesied in scripture a man or a divine being? And the Psalms state quite clearly that he is the divine son of God. This is my son. This day I have begotten thee. The people of Israel are called in scripture the firstborn son of God. Does this mean that they're divine? The truth is that all human beings are the children of God. Why else do we call God our father? So the Messiah is no more the son of God and no less than all the rest of us. The Talmud says the Messiah existed before the creation of the world. How can this be unless he is divine? You have misread the text, Brother Pablo. It says that the thought of the Messiah existed in the mind of God before the creation of the world. How could God create the world without a plan? And the Messiah is the culmination of God's plan for the world. How can the Messiah be a mere man if he is, as you say, the culmination of God's plan for the world? How can the world be saved by a man? The Messiah does not save the world. The world must save itself by turning to the light of God's teaching. Then the Messiah will come. How can man save himself? How else can he be saved? Man is helpless. He is sunk in the sin of the fall of Adam. The coming of the Christ Messiah was to save him. And now he is saved in the great body of Christ, the church. Outside that, he is lost. When Adam sinned, he sinned for himself, not for me. He was a man, I am a man, and each of us is responsible for our own sins and for no one else's. Why should I be damned because of Adam's sin, or need a divine Messiah to come and rescue me, or need a mother church to go back into her womb? If Jesus is not divine, what is he then? Is he a devil? No. But you say he deceived mankind by claiming to be God. He must then be a deceiving devil. My study of your New Testament has shown me that Jesus never claimed to be God. The church has perverted his teaching into idolatry. Is Christianity then idolatry? The first commandment says thou shalt have no other gods before me. To worship a man as God is idolatry. The same idolatry which the Egyptians were guilty when they worshipped Pharaoh and the Romans when they worshipped Caesar. Some rabbis, however, hold that Christianity is not idolatry, merely a heresy of Judaism. Merely a heresy. You have asked for an audience, Rabbi. What is troubling you? I've come to ask you to put an end to the disputation. You too? Why? I thought you were doing rather well. Too well, Your Majesty. I've come at the request of the Jewish people, many of whom have begged me to proceed no further. And what for? I'm looking forward to the closing speeches. We are an oppressed people, Your Majesty. We have many enemies, especially among the Dominicans. A great hatred is growing the longer I continue this debate. I promised you the safety of your people. Trust me. Had I not trusted you, I would not have opened my mouth in this disputation. So there is one Christian that you feel you can trust. Soon there will only be one ruler in Christendom, the Pope, and there will be no fair play left for the Jews. I am still king in Aragon. No one will give me orders in Aragon. Not even the Pope? Not even the Pope. I ask you again. The disputation has gone on long enough. There is no hope of Pablo Cristiani converting me. Let it end. So be it. I ask your majesty's permission to withdraw from your presence. Rabbi. Sit down. Please. You said something today which interested me. You said 
that we can save ourselves. Do you believe that it is possible to commit adultery and be forgiven? We had a king once, our greatest king, King David. He was a messiah. He committed adultery, but he repented and was forgiven. King David, a messiah? Was there more than one messiah? Every king of the Jews is called a messiah. But a sinful messiah? The messiah is a man, and therefore sinful. Every man has an evil inclination which causes sin, but it also causes merit. If there were no evil inclination, there could be no virtue and no repentance. But if a man sins and sins, and does not repent because he loves his sin, then can he be forgiven? No. Ah, well, that is where our sweet Jesus is more merciful than your hard God of justice, Rabbi, for he will forgive us. What good does Jesus' forgiveness of us do those we continue to sin against? It is impossible to be good. We can only ask for forgiveness on whatever terms we can get. It's not impossible to be good. You say our God is hard, but yours is even harder. He tells you that you're all condemned to hell, and then he forgives you like naughty children and you fall on your knees in groveling gratitude for his mercy. Our God has more respect for us. He tells us you are not children but men. You can behave like men, and if you do not, I shall require it of you. Can the desire of the body be good? Was it not created by God? Is it not the movement of the fountain of life? I have written a book about the holiness of sexual desire. Moses ben Nachman. You are a lewd rabbi. Lewd? You talk like a Christian. All the holy earth is filth to him, so he wallows in filth and trembles with guilt. A king should take his pleasures like a lion. Our King David had 18 wives and concubines, and that was considered no sin, only his adultery with Bathsheba, who was a married woman. You are no help to me, rabbi, no help at all. You are either too evil or too good for me. Eighteen wives, and this was your messiah. Rather different from our Jesus. I should have been a king before Jesus came. <laughs> and now let us address ourselves to the highest authority on this subject, the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Let us consider two Jews, the Pharisee and the tax gatherer, standing side by side in prayer. And the Pharisee said as he prayed, Thank God I am not as other men are. But the tax gatherer smote himself upon the breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Christ tells us that the sinner, not the Pharisee, was justified in the eyes of God. The humble sinner, the arrogant Jew. He who looks into his own heart and is appalled by the corruption he finds there knows that without a savior he is lost. Poised between heaven and hell, the pit at our feet, we stretch our arms out to our savior who draws us from the brink of destruction. But the Jew says, the Messiah is only a man and does not bring salvation. He says they do not need salvation because of their learning and their practice of the law which they call the Torah. I say this is arrogance and complacency to look into the abyss and be appalled. That is the beginning of wisdom. And the Jews, for all their superficial cleverness, do not have this wisdom. Their religion is for a scholarly elite. It doesn't answer to the needs in the heart of every man, the high and the low, the righteous and the sinner, the scholar and the layman. That is why Christ Church gains new converts every day. That is why it will conquer the world. Do not think yourself, Rabbi, a great and learned man above the common herd. Look into the abyss. Think yourself a human being like other human beings. Humble yourself. Ask of God, be merciful to me, a sinner. In the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, sent from heaven, 
who for our sins died upon the cross, the divine Messiah. I pray that with God's help, I may have touched the heart of the Jew. Complacent, self-satisfied, superficial. These are heavy charges. To acknowledge one's own sinfulness is certainly a great thing. But shall we call ourselves utterly worthless? Were we not created in the image of God? And is it not an insult to God to call ourselves worthless? Self-criticism is good. And where can you find more examples of this than in our Jewish writings? What other nation has put on record in its sacred book every backsliding, every weakness, every sin and disloyalty of which it has been guilty? The sins of the Jews are recorded there, and our enemies are not slow to use this record against us. But blessed is the nation that is not afraid to give such a handle to its enemies. But let us consider, what is the aim and purpose of humility and self-criticism? Is it not to learn from one's errors and do better in the future? But if we carry humility to such a point that one says, I am utterly worthless, no action of mine can ever be good, then the incentive to improvement has been abolished, and excessive humility becomes an excuse for lack of effort. This is what you Christians do. You ask God to take you over. You give up the task for which he put you into the world, like a child who refuses to walk. And then a worse result comes about. You fancy that God has taken you over, that your Savior has snatched you from the abyss into a state of sinlessness in which you can do nothing wrong. From a state of abject humility, you emerge into a state of incredible arrogance and proclaim that you are saved and that God is now speaking through your mouth. But we Jews know that no man on this earth is ever without sin. Not Moses, not even the Messiah. We must grapple with the evil instinct from the first day of our lives to the last. Is this our complacency? Is this self-righteousness? We Jews, you say, are proud and an elite because we reckon ourselves the chosen people of God. But for what were we chosen? To show all nations an example of a people who is not afraid to stand upright on the earth, to regard no man as God, to look even God in the face and not be overwhelmed. This is why we are the chosen people of God. For God does not want us human beings to be wretches and cowards who dare not stand on our own feet. And this is what makes us hated by all the nations on earth who reckon that we are endangering their lifestyles, their saviors and demigods who save them from the effort of living like men. We are proud, yes. But we want all men to be proud. We were chosen, yes, but for what? for power, for happiness, for rest and security in our possessions? No, for pain and misery and persecution and wandering over the face of the earth. Do not say that we have not seen the abyss. We who are on the brink of it every day of our lives, we who began our journey by crossing the desert with only the pillar of fire to guide us, we have seen it. Yet we continue our journey by the guidance of God's law, which was given for men, not for angels or devils. Moses, who delivered the law to us, gave us also a saying when he stood before his death on the border of the promised land. Be strong and of good courage. It's strange. What's strange? You have treated the Jew with quite unnecessary favor. In my opinion, the Jew won the disputation with a great many points to spare. Why don't you become a Jew then, since you found his arguments so convincing? Don't be ridiculous, Yolanda. One doesn't change one's religion on the basis of a few days of verbal fencing. Besides, it was a pleasure to see somebody fighting with words instead of with a broadsword. Not everyone took the view that the Jew had the best of it but you actually rewarded him. Just a few gold coins. 300 gold crowns. What prompted such a magnanimous gesture? Respect. I have seldom seen so unjust a cause so skillfully argued. He 
may have cause to regret his free and easy manner of arguing on holy topics. Yolanda? I warn you, Yolanda. Do not plot against a rabbi. Plot against him? Is there no need to plot against him? And what about you, James? You may be reconciled with the church, but you still have to put your own house in order. Well? Well, I was just thinking of something the rabbi said to me about King David. Majesty. Rabbi Moses, I sent for you because I feel I owe you an explanation. You understand, of course, that I have saved you from death. I realize that, Your Majesty, and I'm grateful. You should never have written that book about the disputation. The Pope is very particular about books. I was forced to write it because of the misrepresentations that were circulating. I know. I wrote nothing in the book that I had not said with your full permission during the disputation. I know that too. If it had been up to me, you would not have been exiled, but I got into very hot water with the Pope, and the next communication would be awkward. I appreciate that, Your Majesty. Do you feel that I have let you down, Rabbi Moses? I appreciate that you played the game according to the rules, Your Majesty. I'm glad you see that. Where will you go? I understand King Alfonso of Castile is very tolerant towards Jews. I am an old man, Your Majesty. I had expected to die here in Aragon, surrounded by my family, but God had other plans for me. In a way, I'm glad. I should like to die in the Holy Land, the land of my fathers. It's a long way to travel. We Jews are used to traveling. Yes. And what will you do there? There is much to do. The study of the law has been neglected there. I shall build an academy and work for the revival of learning in Jerusalem. The land has too few Jews in it now. We must build a strong settlement in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. But can you do all this on your own? There is another scholar who will help, Rabbi Yechiel of Paris. He too was exiled after a disputation. You should be happy, Your Majesty. Your Christian disputations are helping to revive the Jewish settlement in the land of Israel. Now, that wasn't quite my intention, Rabbi, but I'm glad you accepted in that spirit. How will you live? By my profession. As a rabbi? That is not a profession. I am a physician. A physician? Well, well. I wonder if... Uh, No, it's, uh, it's not important. Is there anything that I can do for you, Rabbi Moses? All I ask is that no other Jew should suffer from the disputation. You have my promise on that. You are a good man. I wish you a safe journey to the Holy Land. And I'm very sorry to see you go. Believe me. Goodbye. Uh, one moment. Sign. Give me your blessing. Yesimecha Adonai Gekoresh Melek Paras Melek Tzedek Bagoyim. What did that mean? May the Lord make you like Cyrus, king of Persia, a righteous king among the Gentiles. You had to go back a long way to find one, didn't you? 